Tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video drops. In this video, we'll talk about a bizarre controversy that happened at the Las Vegas Bowl. Click the card in the upper right corner to join the channel. And join me tonight on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes. Link to play below. And now, on with our feature presentation. On paper, the 2022 NFL Draft was not a very good one for quarterbacks. In fact, many people called it the worst class for quarterbacks since 2013. Especially after the 2021 NFL Draft, where you had three quarterbacks go in the first three picks for the first time since 1999, and where you had five quarterbacks go in the first round, the amount of hype surrounding the 2022 class at that position was minimal at best and non-existent at worst. It was so bad that in the first two rounds, only one quarterback was taken, and that was Kenny Pickett when he stayed at home and went to the Pittsburgh Steelers. His career has not gotten off to a great start, and you can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, despite the absolutely terrible hype surrounding this class, that's not to say that there weren't a few surprises. The Pittsburgh Steelers doubling up on quarterback was somewhat unforeseen. Bailey Zappi going ahead of Sam Howell was something that a lot of people didn't see coming at all. Carson Strong going undrafted seemed surprising, as even despite his lack of mobility, it looked like there was enough talent there as a pure passer for someone to take him in the seventh round. But without a doubt, the biggest surprise had to be the fact that the man you've been watching this whole time, Liberty quarterback Malik Willis, slipped all the way to pick number 86 before being snatched up by the Tennessee Titans. Over the past two seasons, as a member of the Liberty Flames, Willis took college football by storm, and was one of the only times in history that Liberty was put on the map for good reasons. I can say that because they were in the conference of my alma mater for years, so I had to get at least one jab in there at our rivals. Anyways, in the two seasons that Willis played for Liberty, he threw 47 touchdowns and ran for another 27 becoming one of the best and most explosive dual-threat quarterbacks in the nation. And yes, there were some very obvious and apparent flaws with Willis's game. He did way too much dancing back there, and seemed to be a run-first guy that would immediately look to bolt if his first read wasn't there. His pocket presence was lacking, his internal clock wasn't there, and he took way too many unnecessary sacks. You can watch his games against Power 5 opponents in Syracuse and Ole Miss, to know exactly what I'm talking about. He also didn't know when to just eat a play. But you couldn't deny this. When he was on his game, man, he was fun to watch. And he was so good that in 2020, he led the Flames to a 10-1 record and their first ever finish inside the AP Top 25, when they came 17th in the AP poll. And because of his explosiveness and his big playability, especially in today's day and age, where running and explosion are great characteristics for a quarterback to have, a lot of people not only had Willis as the top quarterback in the class, but they had him as a first round pick, and a relatively high one at that. One mock draft done in late March by NFL.com's Chad Rutter had him going number two to the Detroit Lions, having him go higher than Trayvon Walker, the guy who would eventually wind up as the number one pick. Charles Davis of NFL.com published a mock draft in mid-April, just three weeks before the NFL Draft was set to take place, and he had Malik Willis going sixth to the Carolina Panthers. And yet, in a stunning slide, Willis was there late in the third round, when the Tennessee Titans chose him with pick number 86, making him the third quarterback off the board behind Kenny Pickett and Desmond Ritter. On paper, the move made sense for the Titans. They didn't have a backup quarterback, Ryan Tannehill is good enough where you don't have to rush Willis out there, but he's not getting any younger, and he's not good enough to the point where he's the guy going forward, and is the guy that's going to lead you to the promised land, and there's enough upside and potential with him in the late third round that you can afford to take a flyer on the guy. If it works out, you've got the next Steve McNair, and if it doesn't, well, the last three guys to go 86th overall have done nothing, as Wyatt Davis, Zach Moss, and Cahal Waring had underwhelming stints with the teams that drafted them, and they aren't even there anymore. In other words, why not? The plan was never to play Willis. He's clearly not ready, and everyone knew that. The plan was to not let him develop any bad habits, 
Just let him sit for the year and let Ryan Tannehill do everything. However, the best laid plans of Mice and Men go awry. Because in two games this season, the Titans were forced to put their third round quarterback into action. After an abysmal showing by Tannehill on Monday Night Football against the Buffalo Bills, where the Titans lost 41 7 and he threw no touchdowns and two interceptions while posting a passer rating of 32.7 which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play, the Titans brought Willis on to close the game just to not let Tannehill go through the pain anymore. And after Tannehill suffered an ankle injury against the Indianapolis Colts in Week 7 and got sick on top of that, the Titans were forced to play Willis in Week 8 against the Houston Texans and give him the first start of his career. And let's just say that after these two games... Yeah, you can see why the plan was to not have him play this year, and to have him just ride the bench. Because holy cow, Malik Willis does not even look the slightest bit ready to play the quarterback position at the NFL level. Now when I say that Willis has been historically bad, I'm just referring to the way his career has started off. Nothing more, and nothing less. Obviously, in the two games he's played, he's only thrown 14 passes. If we judge quarterbacks on their first 14 passes, I'm not sure how many quarterbacks we would have left in the NFL. But it's been rough watching Willis back there. JT O'Sullivan did a great film breakdown of him and his first start and some of these flaws. So go check that out after this vid if you want to learn more from the technical side and the X's and O's. However, he's been extremely hesitant to throw at times, even when guys are wide open. He's been a bit inaccurate. He's thrown well short of the sticks on third down, lacking situational awareness in that regard. And his first instinct, much like at Liberty, has been to take off and run if his first read isn't there, instead of just going through his progressions naturally. Again, it's early on, and it's been two games and one start, so we're obviously super early into this. But if the eye test hasn't been impressive, neither has the box score. Because in the first game against the Bills, he went 1-for-4, completing 25% of his passes for 6 yards, a lost fumble, and a passer rating of 39.6. And in the second game against the Texans, he went 6-for-10 for 55 yards, no touchdowns, 1 interception, 3 sacks, and a passer rating of 35.4. Yes, the Titans won 17-10, but Willis had to do nothing in the second half, as if you're watching this video... You threw the same number of completions in the second half as Willis did. The Titans only threw the ball once, and while I obviously can't knock a winning formula, and while it was extremely smart for them to chew the clock and just rely on the run since it was working, it showed just how little confidence they had in their rookie quarterback. And again, I'm not knocking that strategy whatsoever. The Jaguars did this in 2017 against the Steelers when Blake Bortles completed zero passes in the second half, and the Jaguars won that game and played really, really well but it just shows how little confidence they had in Willis. And this really bad start by Willis got me to thinking. How bad have other quarterbacks in the NFL fair that had similar starts, where in their first two games, they just looked completely lost out there? Well, I did some digging. And folks, let's just say that even though we're just two games and 14 passes into Malik Willis's career, history is not even the slightest bit on Malik Willis' side. Because when you break it down, Malik Willis has gotten off to a historically bad start. Here's the criteria that I looked at, keeping in mind that I looked at literally the entire history of the NFL, so we're going back over 100 years with no cutoff date. Number one, you had to be a rookie, like Willis is. Number two, you had to throw at least four passes in each of your first two games that you threw a pass in. In other words, not only did you have to come into the game, but you had to actually get chances to throw the ball. Willis's first game where he threw a pass was against Buffalo, and he threw four passes. His second game where he threw a pass was against Houston, and he threw ten passes. Number three, you had to throw for under 60 yards in each of those two games. In other words, not only did you have to throw the ball a fair amount, but you had to throw for just about no yards in those games. Willis threw for six yards against the Bills, and 55 yards against the Texans, so he qualifies. And number four, and this is the big one, in those two games, you had to have a passer rating of 39.6 or worse. 
That's not an arbitrary number. 39.6 is your passer rating if you did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. So in both of your first two games, you had to be at or below that mark where a random fan would have a better or equal rating to you. Willis had a 39.6 rating against the Bills and a 35.4 rating against the Texans, so he qualifies. Just to recap, as a rookie, in your first two games where you threw a pass, you had to throw at least four passes, so you got more than just your feet wet. You had to throw for under 60 yards, and you had to have a passer rating of 39.6 or worse. And in the entire history of the NFL, Willis is just the seventh quarterback to accomplish this awful feat. As for how the other six turned out, yeah, the less said the better. We're going to start back in 1973 with this man right here, New York Jets quarterback Bill Demery. I spoke about Demery a lot in the Kenny Pickett video, how he got signed by the Jets, and just how bad he was, so I'm not going to rehash a lot of those details here in the interest of time, since this video is already over 20 minutes long. However, in Demery's first two games with the Jets, he was terrible. Against the Miami Dolphins, he entered in relief following an injury to Al Woodall, and went 2-for-5 with 14 yards, no touchdowns, two interceptions, and a passer rating of 8.3. And the following week, he got the start against the New England Patriots, and somehow guided them to a 9-7 win, despite going 1-for-7, completing 14% of his passes for 11 yards, and a passer rating of 39.6 with the Jets actually having zero net passing yards while he was under center that day. That awful start, which he was the first quarterback to ever have, was a pretty bad omen for how his career would go. He never started another game after 1973. He never played in the NFL after 1974, and he finished his career with two touchdowns, eight interceptions, and a 22.2 passer rating. One year later, this mark of utility was matched by New Orleans Saints quarterback Larry Saipa, taken in the 15th round of the NFL Draft in 1974. Saipa came off the bench in relief during Week 6 against the Atlanta Falcons, and played terribly, going 1-for-7 with 20 yards passing and a 39.6 rating, and did the same thing in their Week 7 shutout loss to the Miami Dolphins, going 2-for-8 with 22 yards passing and a 39.6 rating. If you're keeping track at home, this means that over his first two games, he went 3 for 15, completing 20% of his passes. And that was a pretty good indicator for how poor of a quarterback he would be in the NFL. He didn't play again after the 1975 season, and he finished his career completing 37% of his passes with one touchdown, three interceptions, and a passer rating of 42.1. Fortunately, it's not like the Saints were banking on him to be the franchise guy as they had Archie Manning for that. But it's not like they got anything out of Saipa either when he actually stepped on the field and had to play. Next up, we head over to 1979 and talk about Jeff Rutledge. When the Rams drafted him in the ninth round of the 1979 NFL Draft, he was there as the backup quarterback for Pat Hayden and Vince Ferragamo, and he was never expected to play and was never supposed to play. However, he was thrust out there in relief for the first time in Week 8 against the San Diego Chargers, and for the second time in Week 10 against the Seattle Seahawks. Neither time went particularly well. Against the Chargers, he went 4 for 12 with 32 yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception, and a 7.6 passer rating. And against the Seahawks, he went 3 for 9 with 22 yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception, and a 2.8 passer rating. Forget 39.6, if you've got a passer rating in single digits in both of your games, that's abysmal. Now in fairness to Rutledge, he went on to have a long career in the NFL as a backup, as he played in the NFL all the way until 1992. For any ninth round pick to have a career that lasts a decade and a half is impressive, no matter how you slice it. But was he any good when he actually saw the field? Not at all. He went just 2-7-1 as a starter completed barely over 52% of his passes with 16 touchdowns and 29 interceptions. And in that long tenure of his, he only had two seasons where he threw more touchdowns and interceptions. He was so bad that when he was with the New York Giants in a 1987 game against the Buffalo Bills, which he started and lost 6-3, to 
he completed less than 37% of his passes with two interceptions and a 33.2 passer rating. And that game was during the strike. So he posted numbers this poor against scab players who wouldn't even be employed 24 hours after the game ended. Not exactly a guy you have confidence in when he's on the field. Up next might be the most disappointing quarterback in the history of the Dallas Cowboys. Here's a guy who was so physically gifted and could have been special, but he just never put it together in the NFL, or even looked close to putting it together. But for Quincy Carter, how he started his career down in Dallas was a very bad omen for how his career would go. He started Dallas's Week 1 game in 2001 against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and then made his second appearance by starting in Week 4 against the Oakland Raiders. As a side note, to learn more about that Cowboys-Raiders game and a bizarre scheduling conflict that caused the game to get moved from its originally scheduled date, click the card in the upper right corner. However, neither game went well at all for him. In Week 1, he went 9-for-19 with 34 yards, no touchdowns, two interceptions, and a 14.5 passer rating. And in week four, he went just one for five with four yards. Carter was absolutely terrible as a starting quarterback, especially for a second round pick. He played four seasons in the NFL and threw 32 touchdowns and 37 interceptions. When you played exclusively in the 21st century and threw more picks than touchdowns, that's when you know you're bad. Next up is the guy that is head and shoulders above everyone else on the list, which is saying a lot about how bad this list is. Because the guy that's the cream of the crop in terms of quarterbacks to start off this poorly, I kid you not, is none other than Josh McCown. The third round pick in the 2002 NFL Draft, which was the same round that Willis was taken in, made two appearances as a rookie off of the bench. In the first one, which came against the Kansas City Chiefs, he went 4 for 12 with 45 yards, no touchdowns, one interception, and a 10.8 passer rating. In the other one, which came against the Denver Broncos on the final week of the season, he went 3 for 6 with 21 yards, no touchdowns, one interception, and an 18.7 passer rating. Again, all things considered, McCown had a good NFL career, and he got to play in the league until he was 40. However, was he ever the guy you wanted leading your team? Was he ever actually good out on the field? Considering his sub-80 passer rating, his 23-53 record as a starter, and the fact that he bounced around what felt like every team in the league? Not really. And the sixth and final quarterback on the list is rather infamous. He's a name that every AFC South fan is familiar with, because he's widely regarded as one of the worst quarterbacks of the 21st century. Watching him on Sundays felt like a crime against humanity if you were a fan of the Indianapolis Colts. Because as you might have guessed, the most recent quarterback to start off as poorly as Malik Willis has after two games was none other than Curtis Painter, drafted in the sixth round of the 2009 NFL Draft. He appeared in relief twice as a rookie when head coach Jim Caldwell decided that going for a perfect 16-0 record wasn't important. On one hand, they made the Super Bowl so you can't say it wasn't the right move. On the other hand, it still stunk that we had to watch this man actually play. In relief, in his first game against the New York Jets, he went 4 for 11 with 44 yards, no touchdowns, one interception, and an 11.2 rating. And the next week, in relief against the Buffalo Bills, he went 4 for 17, completing less than 25% of his passes, with 39 yards, no touchdowns, one interception, and a 15.1 rating. He actually finished his rookie season with a passer rating in single digits. Don't ask me how he played two games, had ratings of 11.2 and 15.1, and it equated to a season-long passer rating of 9.8. Everyone could tell after 2009 that Curtis Painter probably should have been a Painter instead of an NFL quarterback. But if that wasn't evidence enough, he finished his career with an 0-8 record as a starter, helping lead the Suck for Luck campaign in 2011. And he had six touchdowns and 13 interceptions in his career. He was terrible. And trust me, nothing I say can do it justice. If you weren't there to see it, you truly don't understand just how bad he was. It was like the quarterback position was non-existent. So there you have it. The six quarterbacks in NFL history 
to have as bad of a start as Malik Willis had. Bill Demery, Larry Saipa, Jeff Rutledge, Quincy Carter, Josh McCown, who looks like Joe Montana compared to every other name on the list, and Curtis Painter. Combined over the course of their entire careers, those quarterbacks combined to complete just 57.1% of their passes, which is so bad that it would be the third worst completion percentage in the NFL this season, only ahead of Zach Wilson and Baker Mayfield. They combined to have a touchdown to interception ratio of 0.9 to 1, which is abysmal, as on average, they threw more interceptions than touchdowns by a fairly comfortable margin. And if it wasn't obvious enough, teams didn't exactly win games with these quarterbacks under center. None of them ever won a playoff game as a starter, and they combined to have a record of 45-88-1, winning less than 34% of their games, which, extrapolated over a 17-game season, comes out to just 5 wins. And combined, the 6 quarterbacks in NFL history that have as bad of a start as Malik Willis combined for a passer rating of just 72.8 which would only be above Baker Mayfield, Zach Wilson, and Kenny Pickett this season in terms of the eligible quarterbacks. And remember, the only reason these abysmal numbers are even this high is because of Josh McCown, who was admittedly not good at all for just about his entire career, minus an absolutely bizarre couple of games in 2013 with the Bears. If Josh McCown is the ceiling here, and is the only quarterback on this list that isn't absolute garbage, there's not going to be too many people able to comfortably live in a house with a ceiling that low. Again, this is a sample size of six, so by no means is it statistically significant. And Willis has some things in his favor going for him that a lot of other quarterbacks on this list didn't, including the ability to sit on the bench and not be forced to play, a good coaching staff minus Todd Downing surrounding him, a strong running game that will allow Willis to not have to do too much, and an ability to make guys miss in the open field and truly be one play away from breaking something big with his legs. But to say that it's been a rough start for Willis in the NFL thus far would be a massive understatement. Because when you break down the film through the eye test, and when you look at the numbers and the awful company that he's in throughout the entire century-long history of the NFL, Malik Willis has been historically bad. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.